Hello, everybody. I am Roger Waldinger. I'm professor of sociology, director of the Center for the Study of International Migration, and am delighted to welcome you to today's special event. As uh, many of you may, may know, uh, we hold uh, a regular set of book talks every Friday from 12 to 1.30, an activity that's been going on since the beginning of the academic year and will continue uh, through June. But today, uh, we are delighted to be able to have a special uh, session uh, that uh, is going to profile uh, the screening of an award-winning documentary that tells the story of the Aguiles del Desierto, a group of volunteers who searched the Sonoran Desert in Arizona looking for migrants who have disappeared. And we're delighted today to have with us the producers and directors of the documentary, Professors Christy Guevara Flanagan and Professor Maite Zubiarre, uh, both of UCLA, and also with them, uh, Eli Ortiz, who's the founders of uh, Aguilis, and, uh, and Maricela Ortiz and Vicente Rodriguez, who are longstanding volunteers. And so I'm going to turn the platform over to Maite and to Christy, who will provide us with some background about the film. We'll see the film. Uh, and then we will engage in uh, dialogue. And so once the film is, once we, the screening is completed, uh, that will be the time to shift to, uh, to dialogue. So you're free to send questions either in the chat or the Q&A. You can send questions in English or Spanish. Uh, and uh, so we will, we will uh, continue the dialogue uh, until around 1.15. So without further ado, uh, Christy and Maite, why don't you please take over? So thank you so much, uh, Roger, for, for, for this opportunity. It is a great pleasure for us to share, to share our documentary and, and the admirable work of Aguilas de Desierto with a uh, broad community interested in all things uh, migration. Uh, I am Maite Zubiaro. I'm the co-director and co-producer and co-writer of the documentary. Uh, but I would love to have uh, to pass the baton to Christy, who is the director of Aguilas, uh, of our documentary. Hi, thank you so much. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Maite and Roger. Um, Maite and I both are professors at UCLA and we met there. Where Maite was actually a mentor for me. Um, I'm in the film department and I focus on documentary and I was very interested in the work that she did, particularly when she mentioned the work of Aguilas del Desierto. I thought that it would be uh, an interesting project to collaborate on to really bring audiences to the, the desert, to give them an experience to see what the humanitarian group of the Aguilas, what their work is, but also to experience the harsh realities of the desert, what it might be like to walk in the footsteps of the migrants who have passed there. Um, and that's that's really how the work was born. And we're, we're very happy to share the work with you and to have a discussion with the Aguilas afterwards who are we're very honored that they are gracing us with their presence today. Yeah, I think with much further ado, we can watch the documentary just to add very briefly, yes, indeed. Uh, Christy and I had uh, lengthy conversations and our work was mainly on how to highlight uh, the work of Aguilas del Desierto, but of course also the horrifying humanitarian crisis that is going on um, at the US-Mexico uh, borderland. So it is basically a documentary with two fundamental protagonists, migrants, migration, and uh, the absolutely heroic uh, group uh, Aguilas del Desierto. I think Christy, with further ado, you can move to the documentary. Okay, well, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, to look at that spectacular, though deeply disturbing uh, documentary. So uh, I don't know whether uh, might uh, Christie and other panelists, whether you want to say anything first or shall we proceed to questions and answers? I would suggest uh, thank you to everybody who is attending, and uh, I would suggest that 
we have our audience uh, presenting questions and comments. I think that would be ideal to initiate a dialogue as soon as possible. Okay, so, well, the very first question from Patricia Morgan, was that the entire documentary? It seemed very short. <laughs> Christy, you want to speak to that? Sure, sure. Well, it's a, it's a short documentary, so maybe we should have uh, said that a little a little clearer. And one thing that these short documentaries can do is that they can stream on journal, you know, journalistic platforms like the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Guardian, the LA Times. If it was a full feature, it wouldn't be playing there. Um, and we really wanted to do something that was um, impression, you know, made a kind of a, an emotional impression on the audience and maybe was less informational. And um, you can do that in a shorter piece, I think, because audiences will, you know, s stay for that kind of an experience of something that's a little more, um, open-ended and our hopes is that it's a dialogue starter and that people will get interested in issues around the border. We'll go check out Aguilas del Desierto on their website, perhaps volunteer. Um, but yeah, that was that was the, the intention was to make something that was really about the structured on, on the search. Okay. Yeah, I would like to add to that. So I see that Patricia Morgan is adding, short is fine. I was simply curious. I wanted to know more about the story of the people, uh, but I suppose it takes a lot of, of research. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Patricia, for that uh, comment, because exactly that, that was actually one of the purposes of the documentary, as Chrissy was indicating, so, uh, to, uh, to erase visibility about a grave issue that remains uh, strikingly and tragically invisible and to have people want to learn more about it. And I think, uh, Patricia, that we, we, did, we did that now. It, it, it ignited your interest and your curiosity. And, and of course, I'm sure you wanna know more, not only about the documentary, but about the work behind it, which is the work of, of Aguilas del Desierto. And uh, of course, about the humanitarian crisis of the at the border. Okay, a question from Philip Hofer. What has been the response by the U.S. Border Patrol? Uh, Non-response. Non uh, uh, you mean a response to the to the to the situ to the humanitarian crisis, or is it a response? I think he's asking about the film, or perhaps the work of Aguilas itself. Yeah. So, from what I know. Christy, uh, I think we, we haven't gotten any response whatsoever from the border patrol. One of our, or our uh, which could very well be they, they, they don't know about it. <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, Don Vicente wants to say something. Yes, uh, we've been working with the border patrol since uh, we founded the organization in 2011. Uh, and uh, uh, what we do is uh, they have more resources than, than we do. So we partner sometimes with them to, to rescue people uh, because, uh, you know, a life is worth, you can't place money on it. Uh, so we need to use all the resources we can. So we do lean on Border Patrol sometimes to rescue people and they're very accommodating uh, to help us. Uh, so between uh, the two of us, we, we managed to team up uh, in, in, uh, all the way from California to Texas with the Border Patrol you know, for lives are at stake. Okay, a question from, uh, few questions from Irma Olmedo. Do the teams ever use dogs for the search? What do they do with the remains when they find them? And uh, do you have difficulty in getting volunteers? 
Uh -huh. uh, I think I'm going to translate these questions. Uh, so to give Donelli and, and Maricela an opportunity uh, to respond to that. So uh, the, uh, the, one of the questions was, uh, do, uh, does Aguilas del Desierto ever use dogs for its searches? Uh, la pregunta es, es eh, son varias preguntas, Don Eli, Marisela y, y Don Vicente, pero hay una pregunta en particular que es que si en sus búsquedas a veces utilizan perros. Vicente puede. Oh, bueno, sí. Uh, yes, we have utilized them uh, at times. Uh, is a problem because uh, uh, we're into uh, places, uh, designated places uh, where they're not allowed uh, because of the livestock or wild animals. Uh, so it's, uh, we can't use them like we would like to, but we have used them and they have been successful at it. So uh, it, uh, the question is, yes, we have at times. And, and what about the question about, do you have the difficult, perhaps talk a, li a little bit about uh, the process of gaining volunteers, a little more about the history of the group, who the volunteers are, uh, what exactly motivates people? Sí, la otra, la otra, oh, sorry. Eh, no, no, Ellie. Ya, yeah. eh, pues la pregunta es sobre el proceso de conseguir voluntarios. Eh, ya son 10 años de, de la organización. ¿Cómo es ese proceso de, de, de conseguir eh, voluntarios y qué es lo que motiva a los voluntarios a participar en Águilas del Desierto? Ok, el proceso va, es simple el proceso. Eh, hay dos requisitos nada más en el caso de, de personas, digamos... Eh, hispanas o centroamericanas que quieran unirse a la organización es dos requisitos muy importantes uno es estar legal en el país porque estamos en constante en constante nos encontramos mucho con migración o pasamos eh, puntos de chequeo migratorios entonces es uno de los requisitos pero lo más importante lo más importante lo que nosotros llamamos es que tengan eso en el corazón de ayudar a de ayudar a la gente, de, en este caso de ayudar a los hermanos migrantes. Esos son los requisitos más básicos. So there are two uh, basic requisites. One of them is to be uh, documented, not to be an undocumented migrant, uh, because we do cross a number of checking points and we run into border patrol all the time. So, so that is one important requisite. But the most important one actually is uh, your heart, to have it in your heart to help the cause and to help families in distress who, who are looking for their, for their missing loved ones. Okay, a question from uh, Lori Russman. I was struck by the universality of the film's main focus, the respect for the border crossers, finding their bodies for the families of the people so that they can bury them. It doesn't get into the politics. Did you, so this is a question to the filmmakers, did you do this on purpose, i.e. stay away from political contexts? Yeah, I, I'll just say something briefly and then my take can, can continue, but yes, um, part of our, what, part of what has struck me about Aguilas del Desierto is that they do work with so many different entities successfully, many of them governmental, and it takes a real balance um, to, to be able to do so and to still do their humanitarian work. Um, and we felt like that was in some ways, um, you know, going to be the approach of our film. And also we still feel like you can have an empathetic experience and understand how policies are directly affecting this particular issue of migration crossing where people, uh, it's, it's very, um, extremely dangerous and this is because of more recent governmental policies since the 90s that have pushed people farther and farther out into the desert um so it's you know maybe light-handed because we really wanted people to just 
uh, watch the group, see how they work and, and think about the, the kind of heart and soul of their efforts. Um, but you can infer, you know, why, why this situation exists and that definitely has political connotations. Yeah, let me add something to it and then uh, Don Vicente wants to talk. Uh, so yes, the tone is uh, intentionally subdued and wants to reflect and film the dignity and the modesty of Aguilas del Desierto in their altruistic uh, uh, work and of course highlight the humanitarian crisis at the border in particular migrant death. And though it is not explicitly political, it is implicitly very political. And I think it shines uh, through in the, in, the, in the documentary. Also, it starts with indicating that since the 90s, more than 200 uh, migrants have died in the desert, which was not the case before the set of uh, detention through pre uh, prevention through deterrence uh, policy uh, came uh, into place. Uh, but I think Don Vicente wants to say something. Yes, the uh, uh, film really follows the policy of uh, Aguilas, and Aguilas has a set policy that it will not get into the politics. Uh, we are, consider ourselves as workers to save lives, and therefore we're going to work uh, with uh, different agencies and different people just to do that without getting into uh, Politics has uh, one border patrol uh, uh, agent told me, he says, you guys can do a lot of things. You can do things that the border patrol can't. Uh, and, and so with that, uh, we stay away completely from politics. Yeah. Okay, a, a question from uh, Carol Browner. Uh, the organization is now 10 years old. Are more bodies being found over the years? Esa, eh, I'm going to translate that for, for Donnelly, for Marisela. Eh, una, una de nuestras, eh, de nuestras eh, de personas de la audiencia pregunta, eh, sostiene que la organización ya tiene más de 10 años de existencia, ¿cierto? Y eh, quiere saber cuántos cuerpos se han encontrado. Ok. Eh, ya son alrededor de... 98 cuerpos de los que se han encontrado, pero última en los 10 años. Pero lo que últimamente nos ha dado más satisfacción es que hemos estado ayudando a encontrar más personas con vida. En nada más el año pasado se lograron encontrar o rescatar 45 personas con vida. A lo que va ahorita de enero para la fecha, ya vamos ayudando a rescatar 38 personas con vida. Eh, lo que nosotros nos está motivando más es enfatizarnos y prepararnos y distribuir información que nos ayude a prevenir muertes. No queremos, no queremos seguir encontrando ya restos de, de nuestra gente. Lo que queremos es ayudarlos a rescatarlos a tiempo, con vida. Eh, y, eh, eh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to translate into <laughs> English. <laughs> eh, we have found eh, eh, 80, 80, eh, 98 eh, bodies since we started our work. But what really keeps us uh, going and we're very happy about is that we have been able to save 45 lives. And I also, looking at the chat, there was a question actually if Aguilas del Desierto uh, helps uh, migrants, finds migrants that, that are alive. And yes, uh, this, this response to that. Uh, in fact, since January, we have been able to, to save the lives of 38 uh, migrants. And this is actually what really motivates us. And that's what we are now very much engaged with, which is uh, prevention campaigns to make sure to help as much as we can so that we don't run into more remains, so many remains in the desert. And that's, that's our emphasis now to help migrants uh, to stay alive. 
Okay, so I'm going to combine some questions uh, from the chat. So one a further follow up from Patricia Morgan: What what happens when you encounter people who are when you encounter people who are still alive? Do they do they return to their their country, or do you what 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 do you do with them? What what type of con do you have any contact with the border patrol? And relatedly, what are the from Angelica Santiago? What what are the what are some of the obstacles that you've uh, encountered during your searches? So those are really two separate questions. One about what happens when you find somebody who's still alive, and then what what types of pro problems do you encounter when you when you undertake these searches? Eh, dos preguntas separadas. La primera, ¿qué ocurre cuando Águilas del Desierto se encuentra con un, un emigrante que está todavía vivo? Y la segunda pregunta es, ¿en, ¿con qué obstáculos se tropieza Águilas del Desierto durante sus operaciones de búsqueda? Ok, yo respondo eh, la primera y si nos ayuda Vicente con la segunda, voy a responder, ¿qué hacemos con, qué hacemos con las personas que se encuentran vivas? Nuestra responsabilidad como grupo humanitario es ayudarlos cuando los encontramos con vida. No nos importa, no nos importa a nosotros de qué nacionalidad, no nos importa a qué se dedica la persona. Eh, nosotros queremos ayudarlos, les damos eh, agua, comida, y se les pregunta a ellos qué es lo que quieren hacer, qué decisión quieren tomar. Eh, si nosotros... Eh, miramos que están bien y ellos deciden continuar, pues mira, yo ya te brindé la ayuda y es tu decisión si quieres seguir. Se les respeta esa decisión, pero hemos tenido, hemos tenido la mayoría de personas que se encuentran con vida es porque ya vienen, ya vienen mal, ya vienen de, muy eh, pues deshidratadas, perdidas, ya no saben ni qué hacer y ellos optan porque llamemos a la patrulla fronteriza y porque se quieren entregar a ellos. So, yeah, when we run into a migrant that is still alive, we, we are a humanitarian group. So our main objective, of course, is to help and to assist. And that's what we do. We offer water, we, have, we offer food, we help as much as we can. And then uh, we ask the migrant what their decision or what his or her decision is. Uh, if the migrant uh, decides to continue it, uh, his or her journey, that's what the migrant will do. But keep in mind that we often uh, run into migrants that are severely dehydrated, uh, sick, cannot go on anymore. And then they ask us to contact the border patrol. Please call the border patrol we can't, because we cannot continue our, our way. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, there was a, the question about the hurdle. Uh, problems, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, just, just one little add-on to what he was saying is, oh, we have no authority to detain anybody uh, uh, that's walking in the desert. Uh, uh, so we, it's nothing that we can do there. Uh, but the problems that we encounter is uh, is quite a, quite a few problems. Uh, one is that the uh, volunteers have to be uh, well suited to be able to walk in the 125 degree weather in the summertime and freezing cold in the wintertime. And you have to watch out for the snakes and uh, even the mountain lions out there. Uh, and the scorpions, uh, but uh, then then there's the uh, thunderstorm that will come along and and uh, uh, fill the arroyos uh, with water in just a few minutes, and, and people migrants have died trying to cross those uh, arroyos uh, uh, when they're full of water. But uh, the uh, the question of the jurisdiction, the ability to walk in those areas. Uh, in here in California and Arizona, most of the land is owned by the federal government or the Indian reservations and there's national parks uh, and the military base. Uh, so that's uh, about 80% of California and Arizona. Uh, and we have to have permission to to uh, search in some of those areas. Uh, so we always ask for permission. 
and uh, they always grant it. Uh, and, and matter of fact, if somebody is lost uh, and they get notice uh, out there, sometimes the, that authority will ask, uh, will tell the family of the lost migrant to contact us uh, and they will and we will conduct the search on their behalf. So we do work hand in hand with many of the authorities out there. Uh, uh, in, we also stretch into Texas somewhat by telephone. Uh, we do get a lot of calls probably uh, at this time, we're probably getting about 10 phone calls a day of people that are lost in the desert. Uh, but some of these calls, uh, there is no uh, inf enough information that they don't know where they're at. So we can't uh, do anything. Uh, and the most we can do sometimes is call, uh, I tell them call 911. Uh, but uh, as was mentioned previously, we're, we do work on a platform of preventing uh, deaths in the, on, in the uh, desert. Uh, so what we do is we uh, go down to Mexico and Central America and post uh, a poster outlining the problems of crossing the desert. The poster doesn't say to cross or not to cross. And this actually has been vetted by the Border Patrol. Um, that uh, it does list the dangers of uh, crossing the desert or what they might expect. Uh, like I said, the uh, uh, temperatures, the lack of water, and uh, how to be rescued. There is rescue towers out there, but uh, there's not that many because you to talk about 2,000 mile uh, border. I think there's uh, 84 rescue towers throughout the whole border. Uh, so, and the crossing in some areas might be uh, the furthest that I know of uh, that a person has to walk is approximately a hundred miles in a straight line. Wow! Uh, and and that uh, that's in Arizona. Uh, so uh, there is many dangers, and, and people don't know about it. So. Uh, that's some of the problems that that uh, we do uh, see and try to alleviate and however we can. Okay, uh, a question about uh, funding uh, from Carol Browner. Where does your principal funding come from and has it gotten harder or easier to solicit support over the life of your organization? Eh, una pregunta importante también para Don Eli, para Doña Marisela y para Don Vicente. Eh, ¿De dónde viene su apoyo financiero principal, sus fondos? Eh, ¿Y se, se le ha hecho más difícil o más fácil a la organización Águilas del Desierto recaudar eh, fondos a lo largo de su existencia? Uno de los, la mayor parte de, de los fondos que nosotros agarramos para hacer nuestra labor es en los SWATMIS. Vamos nosotros los fines de semana, ponemos una mesa de información y pedimos cooperación a la gente. La gente nos dona de un dólar, dos dólares. Es como eh, se agarra la mayor parte, podemos decir, de, de dinero para las... Para, para hacer nuestra labor. Parte también, pues, de, por medio de la página de Facebook, es como nos donan también. Eh, una cosa que, que no, hemos, no hemos logrado es agarrar fondos de, tanto de una organización grande o del gobierno, ni mexicano, ni americano, de ahí sí es muy difícil agarrar fondos. Básicamente con, con este pues donaciones de la gente es como Águilas del Desierto hace la mayor parte de su trabajo. 
Yeah, so the main the main income that we get for our work is actually because on weekends, the weekends that we don't do the search, estoy añadiendo Don Eli y Don, eh, Doña Marisela que, que los fines de semana que no hacen las búsquedas, pues hacen ese otro trabajo. So I'm adding this because the weekends that Aguilas de Texas doesn't go out the, into the desert, they're still working for the organization because they go to the swap meets and put up a stand with information. And people who, who go to the swap meets, uh, you have one in Escondido, right? So the Escondido swap meet is one of the more regular ones. Uh, but again, they do it every weekend. So people donate $1, $2. Uh, it's a very small amount of money, but it's the people who support, uh, who support us. We also, we also amass some funds through our uh, very active uh, Facebook uh, a page you can find us on uh, in, in Facebook very easily uh, but what we have not been able to do yet is to to get funding from big uh, grant uh, granting organizations uh, gov governmental organization either uh, in Mexico for example or in uh, the United States so yeah that's basically how we get the money for our work Okay, I don't see, uh, do I see anything else? One second. Uh, oh yes, one other, ah, okay, a few other questions. So from, uh, first from, excuse me, from Albert Mankey. Excellent short documentary, what great work. Are you in touch with European organizations that help refugees in the Mediterranean? It would be great to have a comparative perspective on these courageous organizations and their struggle with authorities. Uh, yeah, let me let me speak to that. Uh, sorry, Raj, what was the name of the gentleman who asked? Uh, yeah, Albert Mankey. Albert Mankey, thank you so much, Albert, for your very important question. Uh, and the and the short answer is not, or rather, not yet, because I personally am very very interested in that, and uh, I am. Uh, I'm from many different countries, but one of them is European. I'm from Spain, which means that I'm keenly aware of uh, how water kills in Europe, where sand kills in the United States. So the desert kills in the United States, the, 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 the ocean kills in, in Europe. And, and yes, you're absolutely right. I've been thinking about this a lot, that, that we should have connections or contacts with these courageous organizations that do a very similar work in, in a different physical medium, because again, it's the world. Um, I think it's uh, interesting, and I've seen some documentaries, short documentaries as well on the subject of this idea of the water and, and also people like the Coast Guard in, in other countries, in, in Greece, for example, who find themselves put into this position of being kind of unlikely um, saviors and activists and having to suddenly grapple with um, really dire circumstances that they were not, um, you know, really, did they not, did not volunteer for. So it's, there's some interesting um, connections in that regard too. Okay, excellent. Um, let me bring up another question. Um, so, okay, from Monica Leung. Thank you, Vicente and Eli, for your work. I'm curious as to whether you pay attention to certain policy changes to anticipate and properly prepare for a potential fluctuation in the number of bodies to be found, such as in the current climate, given that Biden has kept the border closed. Do you expect to encounter more bodies of migrants that have been left behind or lost in the desert? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I'm going to translate, uh, voy a hacer, traducirlo eh, brevemente. Quiere decir, si están ustedes pendientes de los diferentes cambios de, de políticas y, y, y políticas públicas y normas, y si eso les ayuda a anticipar si va a haber quizás más muertes en el desierto. Pues se puede, hasta cierto punto se mira, se mira la diferencia o se ha mirado la diferencia ya en los dos gobiernos últimos. Eh, definitivamente hubo mucha restricción para nosotros en, en la, pues con el gobierno pasado. Eh, se nos restringió mucho la información. Eh, antes teníamos, pues no completamente acceso, pero sí era más 
eh, nos daban información más rápido de personas que estábamos buscando, por ejemplo, mandábamos un reporte con patrulla fronteriza y antes ellos nos respondían si sí, esta persona está detenida o esta persona no está detenida, eh, pero en, la, en el gobierno pasado definitivamente nos suspendieron ese tipo de información, ya no teníamos acceso. Ahora en este nuevo gobierno que entró, pues vuelve otra vez ese mismo eh, quieren, quieren tener ese acercamiento nuevamente con nosotros, esa, esa comunicación con los grupos humanitarios, eh, digamos en este caso la patrulla fronteriza, vamos a reunirnos con ellos y platicar con ellos qué es, en qué tanto nos pueden, nos pueden apoyar y ponernos los grupos humanitarios y patrulla fronteriza y consulados a ver de qué manera podemos trabajar más unidos, pero sí se están prestando en este nuevo gobierno. Yeah, uh, certainly uh, the last government, and I would like to point out a question that I see in Spanish actually on the chat uh, from Angélica Santiago, and I think that responds to Angélica as well. Gracias, Angélica, por su pregunta. Uh, uh, how was your experience back, uh, under uh, the Trump administration? So Donnelly is indicating that, yes, the former government made it quite difficult for Aguilas del Desierto to do their work. It was much harder, for example, than the current go government. And uh, Donnelly offers a very specific example. Uh, we would, for example, contact the Border Patrol to find out if uh, the migrant we were looking for was perhaps detained in an detention center, and it would take a long time for them to respond. They were not responding readily at all, so they made it very difficult for us. Uh, the new government seems to have a different attitude. Uh, we will probably meet soon with Border Patrol, uh, and we also want to have a meeting with the different consulates and the different uh, powers at place that, that, that with, with which we work uh, closely, and things to, seem to be, to, are going in a, in a better direction. Don Vicente wants to say something, I think. Yeah, I, I want to speak a little bit about the deaths the, on the border. Uh, basically, uh, I'll tell you how they occur. And uh, starting from the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, uh, the migrants, uh, some migrants, not, not a whole lot of them, but a few, uh, try and cross uh, by boat, by, by pangas, like, like a big rowboat with a motor on it. And uh, they find, uh, Coast Guard find these pangas overturned out there in the ocean. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, they, they find the pangas full of people, who sometimes just the empty panga uh, overturned. Uh, also, people have tried to uh, swim around the wall, which extends uh, about 200 feet into the ocean uh, down to the beach between San Diego and Tijuana and people die trying to swim around it. Uh, you go a little further inland and you know, we have found people hanging by the uh, hand where they gotten stuck and or tried to jump off the top of the wall and they hung up and, and we've been able to, to find a couple of them there. Uh, then people uh, cross sometimes in the trunks of the car, and they there uh, something very sad happens uh, when they do cross, yeah, and sometimes the uh, smuggler uh, just leaves them in the trunk for one reason or another, and they die there inside the trunk of the car. Uh, then you have the, the mountains uh, where it freezes in the winter time, uh, and then you have the arroyos full of water uh, where the thunderstorms will uh, uh, fill the arroyos full of water, and, uh, and we find the dead migrants after that. Then you have the uh, desert, as I mentioned, the, the long uh, walk across there 10 days or so. Uh, and uh, then if you go over towards the Texas side, you'll find uh, the Rio Grande, uh, which uh, people drown in all the time. And over there, uh, the, the humidity, even though it may not be 120 or 130 degrees or whatever, 
the humidity uh, with a temperature of 100 degrees is, is, can kill you also. Uh, so there's various things. People ask me, well, where is it safe to cross it? And I tell them that it's not safe anywhere because you might die anywhere uh, you know, along the route. Uh, so the, uh, the thing about all of this is that there really is no good figures as to the number of people who die on the border. Uh, and I'll give you an example, and I forget exactly what year it was, 2008 or something like that. Anyway, uh, there was a reporter that did a, a uh, video for uh, KPBS here in San Diego, and her name is Jean Guerrero. And the Border Patrol reports uh, every year how many deaths occurred during the previous year. And Jean Guerrero took this one year uh, to investigate what happened in that particular year. And the Border Patrol reported 400 and something died uh, across the border. However, uh, there was actually another 400 that was discovered by the reporter, Jean Guerrero, because she went and, and uh, talked with the authorities along the, the entire border, uh, the rangers and, and the sheriffs and, and the corners as to how many migrants. And she came up with an additional 400. So that meant that uh, the number was really 800 and something. And then on top of that, you have some that are never found on the border. So you might have another hundred. So the, the, the number of deaths on the border, uh, nobody knows and nobody will ever know. Okay, a I, number of, go yeah, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, can, yeah, I would like to add to that. Yes, yes, in fact, and this is, this is, this is, uh, this is a fact, the Border Patrol doesn't report uh, all the cases. And this, ha this started happening till 2015. Uh, I had a conversation with, the, with Dr. Hess, the forensic exam chief examiner at the Tucson work. And there's, things have changed and not everything is transparent. But the fact remains that Border Patrol only takes into account the bodies they found very often or that are uh, found by sheriffs. They do not take into account bodies found, for example, for, by, by day trippers or hunters or somebody who finds uh, uh, remains. They also uh, usually count uh, what is called in, in forensic jargon uh, the, 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 the fully fleshed bodies and do not take into account bones that, uh, according to forensic uh, inquiry, have been uh, on the sand in the desert for more than a year. So there's this discrepancy of numbers uh, officially recognized by forensic examiners going on at least till 2015. And there's, a, a, I think there was a question, a comment about Jason De Leon. If we have uh, worked directly with Jason De Leon, our colleague now in anthropology, uh, not directly on the documentary, but I do have to say that uh, the research I did, because again, this is part of a bigger research and, and, and endeavor that's called Forensic Empathy, and I'm co-writing a, a scholarly monograph. Uh, I do have to say that Jason De Leon's work has been absolutely uh, funda fundamental and has truly inspired uh, this uh, 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 documentary. There's one question, Roger, uh, that I would like to respond, which is about Central American migrants. Uh, I, think, uh, oh, I think, yeah, the question is, uh, I, it's rather up in the, the chat uh, conversation, but it is, uh, it, it, the, the, yeah. So our friend in the audience noticed that uh, the, the, the remains uh, found during our shooting and the in the for for Aguilas were Central American. So the question is, uh, do does Aguilas del Desierto find more Central American bodies now? Uh, es una pregunta para para Don Eli, Doña Marisela. Una, uno de nuestros amigos de la audiencia pregunta que si ha habido eh, últimamente han encontrado más restos de eh, ciudadanos centroamericanos. 
Pues en parte, en parte sí se han encontrado más restos de centroamericanos. La razón yo pienso por eh, no están preparados tanto o no saben tanto acerca del desierto y llegando a la frontera, pues son engañados, ¿no? De cuánto tiempo es que van a cruzar. Ya los mexicanos, pues, o de, ya de los estados más del norte, pues ya saben lo que es el desierto, ya se preparan más. Pero sí, desafortunadamente, es un alto índice de centroamericanos que, que se han encontrado que, que han perdido la vida. Eh, ok. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the response to this is yes, we do find more and more remains from Central Americans and often Guatemalans. And uh, Donnelly uh, is uh, volunteering that uh, the reason perhaps is that they do not know the terrain well, they don't know the desert. Uh, the other reason is that, that, that when they cross the southern border of Mexico with Guatemala, they are not told the truth. They, they are not told how, how much they have to walk. So they arrive already uh, ignorant of important facts. Okay. Uh, Can I add something? Yeah, yeah uh, sorry, Roger, <laughs> I interrupted you. But I do, I would like to add that uh, the Pima County Forensic Science Center in short form, the morgue at Tucson publishes a yearly report and it's very forward uh, and open with, its, with, it, with the data and you can check it online actually. And uh, the, the uh, annual 2019 report is up now. Uh, I'm waiting for the 2020 report that I'm sure will be up very soon. And for the first time ever in that report, uh, in 2019, there were more uh, remains from Guatemalan found, found from Guatemalan found than Mexican uh, citizens. So it's, in, in 20 years, it's the first time that uh, the morgue reg registers more uh, Guatemalan victims. I just wanted to add that to our discussion. I think Donnelly wanted to say something. Uh, mire un, un comentario hace ratito preguntando acerca de las cruces de un compañero Alex pa va cargando una cruz. Es una historia muy, muy bonita que nos acercó a, a unas monjitas, las Felician Sisters, en un, en un este, reportaje que sacó New York Times. La madre eh, miró que nosotros estábamos improvisando, uno de los compañeros estaba improvisando una cruz con los palos, con los hiking poles que llevamos. Cuando se encontró un cuerpo... Y ella, pues, le llamó mucho la atención y de ahí hubo un acercamiento con Águilas del Desierto, se comunicó con nosotros para donarnos cruces. Eh, a través de ese, de ese artículo se hizo un acercamiento con las Felician Sisters, eh, nos están donando las cruces para poner en cada cuerpo que, que encontramos, pero también nos están ayudando más a encontrar fondos para que Águilas del Desierto pues eh, siga haciendo esta labor, pero las cruces, ¿por qué ponemos siempre y llevamos cruces? Porque hay lugares, como estaba diciendo Vicente, que es muy difícil el acceso, como son las bases militares, como son este, las reservas de los indios, que no nos dejan entrar tan fácilmente. Entonces, por eso es que llevamos preparados con cruces y dejarles en honor a las personas que murieron. Yeah, I would like to tell, I see there's a question about the, the crosses and also what is done with the, with the bones. In response to the crosses, this is a very, uh, there's a beautiful story behind it. Uh, the Felician sisters, a uh, religious order, learned about that, us through a reportage or, a, or, a, or a, yeah, uh, through the New York Times. And they saw that we were uh, carrying this very rudimentary crosses that, uh, that one of our volunteers would make. And they decided to help us and have donated these crosses now uh, to us. And they're working uh, very much with us in, in that sense. So, uh, hay una, una otra pregunta relacionada eh, en esa pregunta de las cruces, que es ¿qué pasa con esos huesos que los migrantes, eh, que, que, perdón, que águilas del desierto encuentran en el desierto? Y pregunta que si, que, que se hace con, ¿qué hace águilas del desierto con esos huesos? Es this question about, related to the uh, question about the cross. Uh, what happens to the, to the remains found in the desert by Aguilas del Desierto? What do they do with when they found bones? Do they bury them? What is the process? 
Ok, el proceso que hacemos cuando se encuentran restos humanos, pues es primero, primero uh, asegurar la zona, coordonar la zona, tomar coordenadas. Y así sea un cuerpo, así hace un hueso, o sea, nada más el puro cráneo, porque muchas de las veces ya no está completo lo, todo el cuerpo. Se, se hace el reporte a, al sheriff, de todos modos, a, así sean dos, tres huesos, se hace el reporte para que vayan a, a recoger esos huesos, pero sí hemos encontrado muchísimos. Vamos encontrando una persona a la que vamos buscando y se encuentran varios 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 restos de otras personas más de otros cuerpos. Yeah, the first thing we do when we find uh, uh, bones, we we uh, inform the sheriff. We take the coordinates actually, uh, the geospatial uh, coordinates, and we immediately notify the the, the sheriff about about it. And uh, you do you don't always find uh, or very very un, un, unfrequently actually you find uh, full uh, skeletons. You find scattered bones here and there and sometimes we, want, we found a skull or we, we found we, we find a, a femur uh, still of course we take we take notice of it and we and we immediately uh, communicate with the with the, inform the sheriff about about it and it is that the situation is dire because we are looking for a very, very specific uh, person and migrant that we found family contacted us and while we're looking for, for those particular remains we run into many other remains. Okay, and then I guess one looks like one last question from Irma Olmedo. In terms of prevention, would it be helpful to show this type of documentary at migrant shelters and other places where people gather before trying to cross? Uh, don Vicente, don Vicente wants to talk and I can then translate for, for Donelli and Maricela. Yeah. Actually, yes, uh, this is what uh, we have done in the past, and I've been uh, gone personally down to Mexico and, and uh, also delivered posters to Guatemala and, and Honduras and, and Salvador. And uh, uh, these posters, as I said before, uh, uh, do not say to cross or not to cross, but show the dangers of crossing. And uh, we have gotten uh, good results from them because uh, one of the things that we have really pushed on that poster is uh, for them to get uh, a smartphone so that and learn how to use the, the coordinate system and get the GPS so that when they get out in the desert or wherever, uh, they can call their families up and, and have uh, give them the coordinates of where they're at uh, if they can't continue or whatever problem they may be having and their families uh, will call us uh, but uh, it, it has seemed to to help us uh, get more phone calls uh, and, and and save lives so uh, we will be doing it again uh, this year sometime and we personally will we'll go down there and uh, give talks about the dangers of crossing the border. Don Eli, Doña Marisela, sí, la pregunta que creo que ya la ha respondido Don Vicente es si ese trabajo de prevención que realizan ustedes en los albergues ha arrojado eh, buenos resultados y, y, y está ayudando y don Vicente está diciendo que sí, que además ustedes mismos van a ir muy pronto, en algún momento van a bajar otra vez a la frontera sur y, y, y hablar y dar charlas en esos albergues. Sí, nosotros nos dimos cuenta de eh, las veces que fue Vicente a repartir la información para los albergues, nos dimos cuenta que empezamos a recibir más llamadas pidiendo auxilio, entonces lo que, lo que se decidió que sí funciona, que sí funciona, se tomó la decisión de que se iba a volver a ir a los albergues, pero un poquito más extenso, vamos a dar, eh, vamos a dar como presentaciones en cada albergue hablando de todo esto y esta vez lo vamos a hacer un poquito más extenso, nos vamos a pasar a Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, eh, también se tomó la tarea de, de hacer un canal en YouTube y estamos grabando videos eh, 
dando información de cómo pueden pedir ayuda a tiempo, como estaba diciendo Vicente, que usen, cómo pueden usar su celular, cómo pueden mandar su ubicación, cómo pueden pedir ayuda a tiempo. Todo ese tipo de, de material lo estamos subiendo eh, a YouTube, no con la intención de, de promover el cruce fronterizo de manera ilegal, no, nosotros lo aclaramos, nosotros no estamos promoviendo ni diciendo, vente que aquí te vamos a ayudar. Estamos de nuestra parte queriendo educar a nuestra gente para que se prepare de sus lugares de origen y no venga a morir al desierto. Yeah, yeah, we 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 have we realized that when we did these trips down to the southern border and and did our prevention campaign, uh, it had a, it had an, an effect. We got we got many more calls. And this time we want to expand our operations. First of all, we're putting everything up in our YouTube uh, channel. We have prevention video uh, videos and 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 little mini documentaries. Actually, I mean uh, videos. Uh, talking about all this and also now that we're uh, probably embarking yet on an, on an on another trip we're gonna go even farther down we want to go to guatemala we're gonna cross the border with mexico and go to guatemala honduras salvador to do our work uh, don vicente yeah uh one of the things that uh, we're also going to do is uh we're going uh, we actually do physical searches in in uh, california and arizona and uh Uh, in Texas, we've been able to help uh, because uh, a couple of people over there, one of them is a member of Aguilas, and we are expanding our group, uh, and we're setting up a group in Texas. Uh, we have a number of volunteers already uh, that uh, agreed to be in, in, in Aguilas, uh, so uh, as soon as uh, we can get uh, a few more volunteers and some more funding somehow, Uh, to, we will be stretching out in, in uh, Texas to do our work. Okay, I, so I, I think we've come to the end of our program. I want to uh, thank uh, Maite and Christy for joining us and for producing this extraordinary documentary. And of course, many thanks to Eli, Maricela, and Vincente uh, for uh, engaging with the audience today. And of course, a great deal of admiration for the work, very important work that you are doing. I, I do uh, want to add just a little advertisement about future events. So as I mentioned earlier, we meet every Friday uh, for a book talk. So this Friday, we have a very talk on a very interesting book by a uh, Ki Young Park, who's a professor of anthropology here at UCLA. The book is called LA Rising, Korean Relations with Blacks and Latinos After Civil Unrest, with a comment from Rocio Rosales, who is uh, assistant professor at UC Irvine. So that's 12 to 1.30. And then we will have another special session, similar to this one, uh, two weeks from today, on the H-1B visa system, which is uh, essentially a guest worker program for high-skilled workers. So there'll be uh, 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 comments by uh, Hiroshi Mutomura, professor of law at UCLA, uh, Sabrina Balag Balgamwala, who is a professor of law at Wayne State University, and then a UCLA undergraduate who is on a, a dependent of an H-1 worker and has a very interesting but dismaying story to tell. So I hope that you can join us for these future events. Everything is advertised on our website and Uh, you, if you're at this event, you'll be added to our mailing list. So thank you again to everyone, uh, Maite, Christy, Eli, Maricela, Vincente. Thanks to the audience and looking forward to seeing you at one of our other events. Okay, bye-bye everyone. So much. Stay healthy. Thank you so much.